couple emails. Um, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight from home for a Swanner's E Walks, Talks, and Workshop series. Um, we miss seeing your faces at the Eco Center and around the preserve, especially this time of year when there's lots of new life. Uh, thanks for supporting us during this weird and strange time um, by joining us in this webinar. My name's Rhea Cohn, and I'm the volunteer and outreach coordinator here at the Swanner Preserve and Eco Center. Um, Hunter Clayton Smith is also with us tonight. She's our visitor experience coordinator. Her microphone's being a little iffy, but we can still see her smiling face, and she'll be responding to um, any technical difficulties, emails, or anything. Um, we're really thrilled to have Dr. Peter Howe with us tonight. Um, who's joined us from Logan to share his research. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, thank you as always to Summit County Wrap Tax, who helps to support our walks, talks, and workshop series. Um, WebEx events, which, which we're using right now, has both a chat and Q&A box on the side of your presentation. Um, so we'll be using that Q&A for questions that you have. We'll be doing a formal Q&A at the end of the presentation, but if there's questions while the presentation is going on, throw them in there. Um, if you have any issues or anything, send us a message in the chat. Um, this is an interactive lecture and we will share the link to the polling site to some of the questions once the uh, correct slides are up. So you can pull the link up in any web browser on the computer that you're using or on your phone and you'll be able to answer questions and the answers will show up in real time, um, which is really cool. Um, so tonight we're really excited to have Dr. Peter Howe presenting. Um, he's an associate professor in the Department of Environment and Society at Utah State University. Um, Dr. Howe is a interdisciplinary environmental social scientist um, and studies um, how people perceive changes in temperature, precipitation, extreme events uh, at the local scale in the context of global climate change. Um, so we'll all give him a big welcome by listening into his presentation and let him get started. Thank you all for being here. Great, thank you. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. And uh, so first of all, I hope you're all coping uh, with all the changes and challenges happening right now due to the pandemic. Um, it's uh, it's good to be with you virtually though, and, and uh, hopefully everything goes smoothly uh, for this talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about some of my work uh, on how we think about and respond to climate change. Um, and this comes from my background as a geographer and an environmental social scientist. Um, and uh, I'm interested in how we as individuals perceive and respond to changes in our environment, um, like the changes uh, created by climate change that create major risks for individuals and communities. And um, so over the course of my career, I focused on, on those risks related to climate change, which create a host of challenges and hazards that society is dealing with and needs to deal with in the future. Uh, so I wanna start with a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City uh, before I went off to school at Arizona State, uh, then Penn State, uh, and then Yale, and then came back to Utah State where I've been teaching for the past seven years. Um, and it's really been great working with students and colleagues here at USU and reconnecting with Utah's amazing landscape. Um, some of my ancestors were among the first Latter-day Saints to settle in Northern Utah. And uh, as I learned growing up, uh, Utahns have already done a lot to adapt and thrive in our extremely variable climate, um, including doing things like investing in the irrigation infrastructure to distribute water around the state, like you can see here in this photo, um, here at the mouth of Logan Canyon, um, from our new Highline Trail in Logan, which is a great new outdoor recreation asset if you ever make it up here to Logan. Um, 
But this talk is, so it's not gonna be another talk about the science of how the climate is changing. Um, there are a lot of great scientists, including uh, many at USU who are studying that um, and others around the world. Um, and because of the efforts of those scientists uh, over the past decades, uh, we know that we're living in a hotter and hotter world, uh, that burning fossil fuels is the main cause, and that the risks from that will continue to get worse if we don't take action to limit carbon pollution and adapt to the changing climate that we've created. Um, but in fact, one of the biggest research and scientific challenges now with respect to climate is about us as humans. So understanding uh, the human side of climate change and how we as individuals and society can address the problem successfully and uh, minimize disruption to society and ecosystems as we transition our uh, energy system to one that's more climate friendly. Uh, so the sort of research that I do uh, with my colleagues and students is trying to understand how people think about our changing climate, um, how people think about how it affects them and uh, what we want to do about it. So I broadly study this topic of uh, public perceptions of climate change. Um, and let me start by saying there are a number of reasons why we might, why we might want to study that. Um, so we want to understand how people make decisions to respond to these kinds of big and complex issues uh, like climate change. Um, we wanna help people who are communicating and educating about climate change to better understand what people already know or what they might want to know. Um, and we wanna help policymakers and planners um, and political leaders know what their constituents think about these problems so that they can be responsive to those constituents. Um, and one of the broader impacts of my work that I try to do is make sure that this information is available and relevant uh, at the local level for anyone who wants it. So uh, when it comes to the how, um, the main way we do this is to uh, ask people through large scale scientific surveys um, so that we can understand in a valid and reliable way what people are thinking on these issues. Um, and then the, the research work that I do is focus on developing methods that allow us to drill down at the local level, understand not only what people in a particular place might be thinking, but what sorts of patterns there are, might be from place to place and what might be driving them. And this kind of work involves developing new uh, geospatial and statistical models uh, that take uh, the large amounts of data that we have available now as social scientists um, and to be able to generate usable information at the national and the state and the local and even the neighborhood level uh, all across the country. And this map is just a snapshot of the 24,000 people who are part of our data set now from these nationally representative scientific surveys. And uh, this kind of work, uh, like I said, is important because these, this kind of local data on how people are perceiving and responding to risks like climate change is necessary for uh, leaders and communicators and educators to engage with their constituencies. Um, but even, uh, unfortunately, even in the age of big data now, it's still uh, really expensive and time consuming uh, to conduct a survey that's, that's representative and scientific of your state or your community let alone survey every single state and every single congressional district and every single county in the country in the same way using the same questions. So uh, our research has worked to develop tools to address that issue and take advantage of the, the data we do have at the national level and project it down to scales that are most relevant for people all across the country. Um, and this work has been published in scientific journals like Nature Climate Change, but it's, it's also freely available online um, and ongoing with new data coming in all the time. So we actually have surveys in the field right now um, that we're gonna be using to update our estimates. Um, and I'm sure that's, that's a question you all likely have is how people's attitudes about climate change might be changing during this pandemic. And that's a, that's a question that we have too, and we're, we're collecting data on that right now. Um, and the, the kind of data that, that we generate is useful not only for uh, decision makers and educators, but it's also been widely used by the media um, in the past few years since we first uh, publicly released it. So this is just an example um, that was on the front page of the New York Times a couple of years ago. 
um, and our data have been featured there a few times and in a lot of other news sources all around the country, particularly uh, many local newspapers um, like the Herald Journal here in Logan or the Salt Lake Tribune um, or the Standard Examiner in Ogden, um, uh, because it allows local journalists to tell a local story about what their community is thinking about these issues and situate them against the country as a whole. Okay, so that's a little bit of uh, background about uh, what I do, but um, I'm going to step back here and actually ask you some of the questions that we ask of Americans at large in these surveys. Um, and we're going to be using an interactive survey tool that um, I use in lectures with students, and um, hopefully it'll work here virtually. It, we we try, did a trial run and, and it did work online, so uh, we're going to try this. So, um, you should see the link in the chat. You can also uh, see it here on the slide. If you go to poll ev, P O L L E V dot com slash Peter Howe 212, you can answer this question, um, which is Do you think that global warming is happening? You can answer yes, A, no, B, or C, don't know. And it looks like we have responses coming in already. So I'll, I'll just take another few moments uh, to let you go to this page and answer. And I should also mention that if you, uh, if your web browser is tied up with this, you can also text uh, Peter Howe 212 to the number 37607. Uh, and then you can text your answer A, B, or C, and that'll show up here too. It looks like we have a lot of consensus among our viewers tonight. Um, we're, we're at 100% uh, who would answer yes, we think global warming is happening. So I will, let's see how we compare to the rest of the country on that question. We're at 100% among uh, all of us here present on this talk virtually. As that compared to the rest of the country? Well, um, fortunately, so my colleagues and I have been conducting nationally representative surveys on climate change going all the way back to 2008. So we can not only look this year, but going all the way back till then um, and see what the American public thinks in pretty fine grained detail. Um, and so on this question in the most recent survey, uh, as of, um, this is as of uh, last year, um, we had about 69% of Americans who would say yes on that question. They think global warming is happening. Um, and that, that number, about two thirds of Americans, uh, is pretty stable uh, over the years. Um, so we, when we first started running these surveys in 2008, we got 71%, and we had a drop into 2010 down to 57%. And then we saw a slight climb up from, from there, but it's generally pretty stable at about two thirds of Americans who would answer yes on that question. Now. Uh, and then we have another uh, about 15% or so who would say, no, they don't think global warming is happening. Now, uh, using the statistical tools we developed, we can actually sort of apply a microscope to this data, this trend line that you see, and look at uh, not only what the country as a whole thinks, but what people in every state think. So this is taking all of the data we've, that we've collected and um, mapping it to the state level. So this is a map of our most recent data. Um, and you can see that uh, a majority of Americans in every state think that global warming is happening. Um, every state is uh, an orange to red color on this map, which means they're over 50% on that question. Um, and that ranges from a high of 80% in DC uh, in, our in our latest models to a low of 54% in Wyoming and West Virginia. Here in Utah, it's 62%. Uh, so around two thirds of Utahns who would say yes, they think global warming is happening. Oops. Let's see, there we go. Um, so now we can actually increase the power of our microscope, so to speak, and uh, look at how people in every county think about this. So. Um, here the map is pretty similar, although we do start to see some blue show up here uh, where counties are just below 50%. So 
But we have majorities of people who would say, yes, global warming is happening in all but 52% of the 3,142 counties in the US. Um, and you rarely get this much agreement in public opinion surveys about anything. So zooming into Utah, um, here we can see what people uh, in Utah think at the county level. You may have noticed that we have one of those uh, or several of those blue counties on the map. Um, Emory County here is uh, the, uh, the darkest blue, so to speak, um, where 45% of people in Emory County think that global warming is happening. In Salt Lake County, it's 71% from our data. In Summit County, it's also 71%. And up here in Cache County, we're at 64%. So uh, our research shows that pretty much wherever you are in the country, um, there is a lot of agreement about this, about this, this question, do you think global warming is happening? Most people who you, who you would talk to would say yes, they, they do think that global warming is happening. Of course, this is just one of um, many of the questions that we ask about. So we might also wonder what people think about the main causes of global warming or climate change. So here is this, this will give you another chance to participate here. Um, this question is, assuming global warming is happening, do you think it is A, caused mostly by human activities, B, caused mostly by natural changes in the environment, or C, other, something else? And it looks like we've got responses already coming in. That's great. I expect we'll see a lot of consensus on this one as well. We'll just wait a few more moments to give you a chance to respond here. Okay, so 100% of us looks like uh, would say that global warming is caused mostly by human activities. How does that compare to the country as a whole? Take a look. Um, so across the country, a majority do say that they think global warming is caused mostly by humans um, at 55% um, as of our latest surveys. Um, now this is slightly down from last year um, or from uh, uh, the end of 2008, I should say, um, which was the highest uh, in our 10 years of surveys at 62%. But still, this is, has been relatively stable over the years at just around a half, a half of Americans who would say, yes, they think global warming is caused mostly by humans. And then we have another third who would say that it's caused mostly by natural changes in the environment. Now, if we look at a map of this question, um, we do see more disagreement in some places. Uh, in 29 states, the majority of people think that global warming is mainly caused by humans. Um, and uh, in, in the remainder, we have a slightly less than majority, including here in Utah, where it's at 47%. And looking at the county level, uh, we can also see some pretty distinct patterns and variation around the country. Um, if you look at this map, you take a second to study this map, um, you may see some patterns that start to look familiar to you if you've looked at county level maps of things recently. Um, you may see that this resembles a county level election map, uh, say from the most recent presidential election. Um, and that's not a coincidence. Um, global warming has become a very politically polarized issue. Um, and so, you know, as a social scientist, if, if we know what political party someone identifies with, that is by far the best predictor of how they would answer this question and many other questions related to global warming and climate change on surveys. And we see uh, on this map that people in generally left-leaning places, um, like if you look at, say, coastal California um, or uh, the New York area, um, say that uh, more people think that global warming is mostly caused by humans in those places and then Vice versa, um, let's take rural Utah or rural Wyoming as an example. We have uh, substantially fewer people who would say that global warming is caused by humans. And these patterns do, uh, they are reflective of the political polarization of this issue. If we zoom into Utah, um, we do see a lot of differences around the state, um, as you might expect if you know about the political geography of Utah. Um, we see Salt Lake County, Summit County, 
uh, and Grand County have around 55 to 60 percent of people who would agree that global warming is caused mostly by humans. Um, and looking at those three counties, Salt Lake, Summit, and Grand, um, you may have heard about how Salt Lake City, Park City, and Moab were the first to pass resolutions to transition their energy system to 100% renewables by 2030. Um, and so it's not really not an accident necessarily that the governments um, in these places um, ended up passing these resolutions um, because uh, political will in those places tended to be in favor of those. Um, but it also looks like there are opportunities in other parts of the state um, for uh, similar kinds of resolutions um, or policies. So we could look at Cache County, where it's about 50% on this question, uh, or Weber County, where it's above 50%. Willow County is close to 50%. San Juan County, down in the southeast, is also above 50%, um, who think that global warming is mostly caused by humans. And um, Another interesting feature of this map, um, you know about the geography of Utah. Um, you may have noticed that we have one of the biggest differences between neighboring counties of anywhere in the country um, on this question, and that's between Emory County and Grand County, um, where there is a 20 point difference on this question between those two neighboring counties. Um, Emory County is the big dark blue county. They're kind of in the middle to the right, the middle of the state, and Grand County is the slightly is the, the orange to yellow one uh, directly to the right of that. And um, if you're familiar with those places, you know that Emory County is home to Utah's coal industry. Um, we have two large coal fired power plants there. Um, well, Grand County next door um, is heavily reliant on the outdoor recreation industry based in Moab. And so these are two very different communities um, and that's that shows up in our, our survey data. Um, and the example of Emory County is repeated in a, in a few other places around the country. Uh, and we found in our research that places like this that are heavily reliant um, on the fossil fuel industry do tend to be more uh, dismissive of global warming all around the country. Um, however, we want to so people in both uh, Emory County and Grand County um, are both going to be affected by a changing climate. Um, and we need to make sure that people in both these places and, and other places around the country and the, or around the world um, aren't left behind as we plan to transition our uh, energy system to, uh, to clean energy um, and prepare for a more unstable climate. So another thing uh, on our surveys that we ask about is uh, whether people know about the scientific consensus um, and what they know about the scientific consensus around global warming and climate change. So here's another question for you. Um, to the best of your knowledge, what percentage of climate scientists think that human-caused global warming is happening? And go ahead and enter uh, the number that clo comes closest to what you think here. This is just your own estimate. Anywhere from 0 to 10 percent, 11 to 20 percent, all the way up to 81 to 90 percent, or 91 to 100 percent, and every everywhere in between, or you just don't know. We'll take a moment here for the answers to come in. All right. It looks like. We've got a pretty clear majority here. Things are moving around a little bit. But we've got a clear majority there um, here at 91 to 100%. Um, with uh, the second group, 36% here in the 81 to 90% category. All right, so how does that compare to the actual scientific consensus on human-caused global warming? Um, when we look at studies that have analyzed the scientific consensus, we find that it's uh, generally 97% or more of climate scientists who think that human-caused global warming is happening. Um, so you, the majority of you all were right on. Um, this, is a, this kind of consensus is extremely strong um, when it comes to uh, consensus on any scientific question. 
Um, this level of consensus is similar to the consensus that cigarette smoking causes cancer. So it's extraordinarily high now. Um, however, when we ask that same question that I asked you to uh, Americans, we find that uh, most don't know about the, this extent of, of extremely strong scientific consensus. So only 17% would answer in that 91 to 100% category. That, um, and then the remainder would say it's either a, less of a consensus than that, or they just don't know. Uh, and so this, this idea of what of knowing about the scientific consensus is critical from our perspective as social scientists, because we've found that um, it's one of the most important things people can know about the issue of climate change. Um, communicating the extent of the scientific consensus is a really important message that can help people understand the issue better, help to update their own, own opinions and um, help people uh, or, uh, engage with the issue and hopefully want to learn more. And um, some of the research that we've done on this um, is an experiment with uh, over 6,000 people around the country a few years ago, um, where we actually presented people with a message about the actual strong scientific consensus about climate change and found um, that presenting people with this message caused them to increase their own estimates of what the consensus was, as you might expect. Um, people in every state responded to this message that they understood it. Um, and it caused them to update their own under understanding. Um, but more importantly, we found that people in states that started out with the lowest average level of understanding of the scientific consensus actually responded the most. So in places like Wyoming, which is dark green, and North Dakota and West Virginia um, on this map, um, these are the places that actually updated their understanding the most. Um, so this, this suggests to us that you know, if you're going to be telling some someone one thing about global warming or climate change, um, we would recommend telling them about the very strong scientific consensus that it's happening and we're causing it. So we also ask uh, in our surveys about uh, how much Americans support a lot of different policies um, that we might implement to address climate change. Um, and uh, the New York Times ran a feature article using our data um, a couple of years ago. And um, I'm going to show you some of the maps that they created. Um, and our findings are actually really clear when it comes to policies, like much more clear than the previous questions that I presented to you. There's actually a lot of support around the country for a lot of different climate and energy policies. Um, for example, here's a map showing uh, support for requiring utilities to produce a percentage of their electricity from renewable sources, even it costs, if it costs the average household an extra $100 per year. Uh, we have majorities in every state and almost every county around the country that support this, um, including majorities in most of Utah um, and 58% uh, in the state as a whole. We have um, extremely high support for renewable energy around the country. 82% uh, of Americans and over two thirds uh, of people in every single county around the country support tax credits for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles or solar panels. Um, and that includes 82% of Utahns. So we are right there in line with the country um, on this question. Uh, and there's also broad support for a carbon tax. 68% um, of Americans support a carbon tax if it's described like this, um, requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax, and using the money to reduce other taxes, such as income tax. This is, this is one particular frame related to a carbon tax, but we've also surveyed using other frames and found similar strong support. 62% um, of Utah support a carbon tax um, with this question. Uh, so I've presented a number of different results and you might be wondering how much to trust these numbers. And this is also a big part of our research. Um, so we've been, as we were, we've been developing these techniques to create these maps, we wanted to make sure that our numbers were valid and reliable. So one of the ways we did this is to conduct separate surveys um, in some randomly selected states and cities um, and compare them to our data. And we found that um, our data were within three percentage points of these separate surveys. Um, and we've had other 
uh, researchers who weren't affiliated with us do similar things and, and find um, similar strong agreement. So we actually don't necessarily know which is more accurate between our, our statistical models based on our own national data or these separate surveys, which is a really encouraging result. So uh, here, getting close to the end, I wanted to um, show you some results from another research project, which is um, particularly relevant right now, um, which is re also related to climate change. Um, we focused on a particular behavior that people can take that will help them prepare for the impacts of climate change. Um, so in this map, you can see that the purple states are below the average for the country. And the orange states are above the average. And Utah probably stood out to you here um, on this map. And I've covered up what the question is, um, but you may have guessed, and it's particularly relevant during our current pandemic crisis going on right now. Here it is. Um, you have supplies set aside in your home to use in case of a disaster. And um, Utahns, um, lead the country on this, 58% uh, of Utahns said they had supplies set aside as compared to only 41% of Americans on this question. Um, and uh, other states that scored well on this were Alaska, Hawaii, Florida, um, Texas, Virginia were also relatively high, Idaho, California, um, but Utah was much higher um, than the country as a whole. And this particular thing that you can do setting aside supplies to prepare for disasters is, is one thing that, that individuals and households and communities can do to, to help become more resilient to climate disasters. Um, and that's one way that we, we here in Utah are doing well compared to uh, many other places. Um, this is just a map that shows a little bit increased resolution on that question um, at the city level, and you can see some pretty similar patterns. Um, and we hope this kind of data is useful for decision makers and people at the local level to help them understand how their areas are doing uh, compared to others. So let's see, uh, I have one more question uh, that you can answer here. How often do you discuss global warming with your friends and family? So you can answer A, often or occasionally, or B, rarely or never. And we'll take a few moments for more responses to come in. Okay, so this is a pretty encouraging result, it looks like. Um, vast majority of us say that we discuss global warming often or occasionally, um, which is really great to hear. How do we compare to the country as a whole? Uh, well, those 9% uh, of you who said you don't talk about it much are not alone. Um, so over the past 10 years, we see that um, most of the country says they, they talk about it rarely or never. Um, that's at 63% in our last surveys and only 37% say they talk about it often or occasionally. Um, why might that be? Um, if you think about why, why people choose not to talk about global warming or climate change. One hypothesis that uh, researchers have put forward is um, that it's due to something called uh, pluralistic ignorance. And this is the idea that we, we think fewer people agree with us than actually do. So we tend not to bring up this topic in conversation because we think um, whoever we're talking to might not agree and we don't want to start uh, an argument. And um, so hopefully, you know, based on some of the, the data that I've shown you, um, those of you who aren't talking about it as much would consider talking about it a little bit more because there are a lot of things that we do agree on um, that most Americans, most Utahns do agree on related to climate change. We can't really address this problem very well if we don't actually go out and talk about it. Um, and for, on this question, if we look uh, across the states, um, we see that it's uh, we don't have a majority anywhere, unfortunately, who say they talk about global warming, um, at least occasionally. Um, however, 
37 uh, percent of Utahns say they talk about it at least occasionally um, which is actually a little bit higher than the national average um, so there's something potentially happening something going on here in Utah that's leading us to talk about global warming or climate change a bit more than average for the country as a whole um, we're not sure what that might be yet um, so that's and that's certainly a question um, that that we're interested in as to why that why we see that pattern um, what's going on here in Utah that might might lead to these discussions happening a little bit more than in the rest of the country so for those of you who are talking about climate change or who want to start talking about it more um, I, I want to uh, mention some something that we call the big five key things that you, to know these are some of the, the most important things um, to know about climate change and, and that you can use uh, to talk about it. Um, and so it's these five key points here. The first is that it's real climate change and global warming are happening right now. Um, Second is that it's us. Uh, we know that uh, global warming is being caused by humans and that it's up to us to stop it. Um, the third key point is that experts agree. So as I talked about earlier, there's a very strong scientific consensus um, among scientists who study climate that climate change is happening, um, that we're causing it, and uh, along with point number four, that it's bad. Um, Climate change is already causing uh, dramatic changes to weather around the world, um, impacts on ecosystems and societies, and these kinds of impacts will get worse if we don't slow it down. Um, but the last, um, and I think the most important point, is that there's hope. So we as a society can solve climate change, um, but it's a matter of implementing changes in policy that help us move away from fossil fuels and transition to a clean energy economy as quickly as possible. Uh, and for us as individuals, it's a matter of making our voices heard to political leaders in charge of making those policies. Um, so hopefully you can keep in mind these, uh, these big five key points when you do talk about climate change. Uh, most importantly, that last one, that there is hope and that we can solve it. Um, so uh, one of the big things I hope you also take away today is that um, more of us agree that our climate is changing than you might think. Um, and most of us agree on many of those solutions like transitioning our energy system to uh, clean renewable energy. Um, and I'd encourage you to try talking about global warming and climate change more often um, since we really can't address this problem without acknowledging it and talking about uh, how to solve it. And um, as I talked about at the beginning, um, we know that Utahns have uh, adapted to our really variable climate in the past. Um, and as we face a more unstable climate in the future, I hope that uh, we're able to have a conversation about what we can do to prevent the worst of these problems uh, and adapt to uh, the future climate that we're all going to be living in. And with that, um, I will just uh, Turn it over to questions, and I want to leave uh, leave up this slide, which will give you some uh, directions for where you where to go next if you want to learn more about uh, science of climate change. I recommend going to the National Climate Assessment reports, which are great. They summarize the, the best science on the issue. Um, the website skepticalscience.com is a great resource to to go to to learn how to correct people's misunderstandings about the issue. And then if you want to dig into these maps and learn more about them, you can just go to them at climatecommunication.yale.edu. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I love those links. Those are new to me, so I'm excited to check those out. Um, and we'll share those with our attendees. Um, there's both a Q&A on this side and a chat function. So if you have a question, um, that you'd like to ask, type it in there and um, we will field that uh, since all of our attendees are muted. Um, one of my questions I had, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but I'm wondering what um, level people 
trust the most, like if they trust their city government the most, if they seem to trust their county, um, their state versus like a federal, um, if you have any information about that. Yeah, so uh, in general, um, even just beyond climate policy, um, people tend to trust uh, the level of government that's closest to them. That's, that's sort of the smallest level of government. So it would start at the, the city level and go up to the county and state and, and the level of trust in the federal government is lowest, um, as you might expect. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Joan. How did you survey these people and how many were surveyed? I guess it kind of depends on each study that you've done, um, but I'm interested in the method of surveying as well. Yeah, um, and that's a good question. So um, the surveys that we do are um, nationally representative and what, so it used to be that that uh, public opinion surveys were pretty easy. So you could just uh, re select random numbers from the phone book is, is how, how they used to do it. Um, and you'd get a, if you selected a thousand random numbers around the country, you'd get a pretty good sample of, of the country as a whole. Um, but people don't answer their phone anymore. We don't have phone books. People move around, they use their cell phones. Um, so we can't necessarily do that anymore. Um, what we do now is we use something called probability based uh, online panels. And these are um, online surveys that are um, scientific and they're actually run by um, a number of different organizations and companies um, who use. Uh, address-based sampling. So they sample addresses around the country and they, using uh, mail and telephone, they invite them to be part of what we call a panel, um, which means people who they, they contact agree to answer a few surveys during the year um, and are compensated to, to do that. Um, if they don't have internet access, they're provided with um, a computer or a tablet to answer those surveys. And these uh, these panels are rigorously designed to, to match the population of the country in terms of a lots of different attributes. So they, they match them on uh, where people live, on their demographics, things like gender and age and race and ethnicity and political affiliation. Um, so those so we we run surveys with around a thousand to fifteen hundred um, people uh, from these probability based internet panels. Um, twice a year, and those are the data that go into the maps that you see, um, and that those are, those started back in 2008, and we're running them twice a year now. And like I mentioned, we have one that's uh, in the field right now, and hopefully we'll be able to release data uh, fairly soon on that. Awesome. Yeah, gone are the phone book days for sure. Yeah. Um, a comment from Maureen. Uh, who noticed just how clear the air is in Salt Lake right now? So I know in Logan, you guys have similar air quality issues um, just with the inversion. Uh, so the air was so clear, it almost hurt her eyes, which is pretty awesome to hear, I guess, uh, but kind of a stark contrast to what we've been living. Um, and I guess um, if there's been any kind of change in public opinion about this with the pandemic that's going on, if it's too early to tell, if that's just all kind of conjecture. Um, but it seems like people are taking notice of these effects a little bit. Yeah, yeah that's true. And um, we, we don't have um, a lot of clear data yet, um, although we're all thinking about this. Um, and there's, there's data collection efforts that are, are in the field right now. Um, I have some early data that's coming in that, that is indicating that um, people's level of concern about climate change hasn't dipped, um, hasn't been replaced by concern about the pandemic, for example. Um, but um, the point about air quality, yeah, is a good point. Um, I mean, so one thing that that maybe this shows us is that um, it's possible for us to uh, implement changes as a society relatively quickly. Uh, now that's I, I say that very hesitantly because these changes are causing huge disruptions and huge challenges and, and tragedies for a lot of people. Um, but uh, hopefully this illustrates um, that these changes are possible and these, this is the scale of changes um, 
that we need to implement in a less um, drastic or less um, immediate way, hopefully. Um, but this is the scale of changes that we do need to implement uh, to address climate change. Really interesting to think about. Thank you. Um, Katie asked uh, how the percentage of Americans who believe in climate change compares to international percentages. If there's some studies about that. Yeah, um, so uh, we've actually done similar work um, where we've mapped opinion in Canada. Um, so if you go to climatechangecommunication.yale.edu, you can see um, the Canadian Climate Opinion Maps Project. Um, and there's been other um, other national level surveys around the world um, in many different countries. Uh, and there's variation. Um, so generally, Americans are are less concerned than um, than Canadians, or uh, we're less concerned than most Western European countries. Um, we're we're less concerned than much of Latin America as well. Um, and uh, and similar to places like Australia, however, and um, uh, certain other countries that I'm not remembering the exact numbers right now, but um, we we actually do need better uh, surveys in. A lot of the world, though, so um, there are places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Asia, where uh, the kinds of surveys that we have in the U.S. are are not conducted very frequently or, or at all. Um, but everybody's being affected or will be affected by climate change soon, um, and so we need to be out there collecting more data about how people are thinking about and responding to it. Wow, very interesting. That definitely answered my question as well. With Kind of about areas that need more surveying or traditional survey methods don't work um, exactly. Um, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, throw those in. Otherwise, um, I think we'll wrap up. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, Thank you. I love the links that you've shared, and we'll definitely share those with everybody. We've also recorded this lecture, so if anybody showed up late, um, if you weren't able to access the lecture and are watching it now uh, at a later time, um, we'll be sending that out to everybody. So, well, it looks like we have one more question. Um, can Photos from the International Space Station be used to push the cause of climate change. I don't know how much you can speak to that, but. Well, um, yeah, I, I think the, the questioner is referring to, you know, photos that show um, the Earth as a whole, you know, they, they can illustrate um, the fact that we are on, we're all living on the same planet. Um, we're all living within the same climate system. Um, and those kinds of photos, I think, are helpful to com for communicating that, yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. No borders in that. Uh, one more question from uh, Mary. What's your advice on working with children on this topic to prevent fear, but still needing it to be realistic? Um, mm. I know a lot of adults that this could apply to as well. Yeah. Um, and it, that's the, it's a great point. Um, so we want to be realistic, but, but we, we don't, um, we don't want to inspire fear without giving people realistic things that they can do about it. Um, that's why I think that fifth point in those big five key points, um, the fact that there's hope that we can solve this issue, um, is the most important thing. So, um, whenever, whenever I talk about climate change, I make sure to emphasize that, um, it's it's kind of a, a basic tenet when it comes to talking about any any kinds of risks that people face is you don't want to just scare people, um, whether they're children or adults. Um, you want to couple the, the information about these big scary things with what people can do about it. Because if you don't do that, then one thing that, that makes sense to a lot of people is to deny what you've just told them, to to, to think that, oh, you know, I, I can't do anything about it. So maybe it's not real or maybe I'll just be fatalistic about it, and there's nothing I can do. Um, so it's it's important to talk about these kinds of of things that we can do um, whenever you're talking about climate. Yes. 
Awesome. Yeah, there's, which is the best, the best thing. Um, cool. That is all the questions that we have. So I think we'll wrap it up. I want to thank you so much for joining us virtually. Um, this has been so great to be able to continue our walks, talks, and workshop series virtually. So people from the comfort of their own home and uh, a great topic to talk about and inspire some hope during these pretty cold and interesting times. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all. All right, bye everybody.